Welcome to the 2016 Swanberg Lecture in Military History. I'm delighted that all of you could come out on such a wet, cold evening. This lecture is made possible by a generous donation from Mr. Arnold Swanberg, one of the department's distinguished graduates. W right, Arnold? <laughs> Without his support, this program would be impossible. We also want to thank the professional technicians from the Denison Theater, who always do such a stellar job for us, and the professionals from MCAT, who will make this talk available to an even larger audience. It is a distinct honor for me to introduce to you Brigadier General Robert Doty, who I put, quote, retired, unquote, in July 2005, after 40 years of distinguished service in the U.S. Army and to the military history profession. Retired may be the wrong word, for he continues to do research and to challenge certain shibboleths that have dominated the field. Few, if any, have played such a decisive role in the development of military history in the United States. He has, as another noted, shaped both the historiography of the discipline in which he published and the academic world in which he taught. General Doty is part of the Long Gray Line. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy, West Point, in 1965 and received his Ph.D. from Kansas University in 1979. He served in a variety of military assignments in the United States, Europe, and Vietnam. His awards and decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Combat Infantry Badge, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gall Gallantry with a Silver Star. His many talents are illustrated by some of those assignments, an advisor to a Vietnamese armored cavalry troop, and a speechwriter for the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. He acted as head of the Department of History at the United States Military Academy West Point from 1985 until 2005. He brought to that position a combination of rigorous intellectual standards and scholarship expanding the teaching mission of the department to include an emphasis on research and an insistence that teaching be grounded in scholarship. He set the example for men and women to become soldiers, scholars, and teachers. By recruiting highly qualified officers and by sending them to first-class graduate schools. Moreover, he identified and may identified distinguished military historians and shepherded the writing of a new textbook, Warfare in the Western World, which became the standard in military history programs across the country because of its coherent operational focus. During his tenure at West Point, he set up staff rides for cadets to, among other places, Normandy and Germany, and the endowment for a chair for a visiting professor. His impact will be felt for many generations to come. During his tenure, he trained many officers who became professors at universities, faculty at armed forces educational institutions, war colleges and command and general staff institutions, civilian and political military analysts, museum directors, and directors for armed forces history programs. Others went on to challenging positions in operations planning and doctrinal development. One of his officers is now serving as the Commandant at West Point. He also instituted summer seminars and staff rides for civilian military historians attended by, among others, our own illustrious and incomparable Harry Fritz. That, Western Point, that West Point summer seminar in military history has significantly advanced the teaching and the practice of military history. In the midst of all these responsibilities, he wrote numerous articles and four books. Those books received the Paul Birdsall Prize in Strategic and Military History from the American Historical Association, the Distinguished Book Award in European Military History from the Society for Military History, the Norman B. Tomlinson Jr. Booker Prize, the Western Front Association, and the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize from the Society for Military History. General Doty has come to us to discuss his area of expertise, World War I, 
what has been called the great seminal catastrophe of the 20th century that has shaped and continues to shape the politics, society, and culture of our world. Among the tsunami of books marking the centennial of that war, his works stand out for their lucidity, clarity, and wit. Pyrrhic victory, French strategy and operations in the Grant War, in the Great War, illumines the controversies that surround French strategy. That book has been praised as the best English language book about French strategy in the First War, a service to history, to France, and to us. Another noted that it has changed our perceptions of how and why the French fought as they did. Yet another notes that it represents one of the most important contributions to the history of the war in the last 50 years. I have lured Bob and his lovely wife Diane here from the warmth of Louisiana where he was fishing and advocating the breeding lines of a weird little dog called the Catacoula Cur, which he will tell you is really legitimate. Don't believe it. I lured them here with the promise of a warm fall. Oh well, I did my best. Okay, so please join me in extending a warm Montana welcome to Brigadier General Doty and his wife, Diane. Let me begin by saying the reason we stayed so long at West Point is we really like the people there and we like the people who came through there, such as Professor Fry, Linda Fry, who was often accompanied by her sister, Marsha Fry. Uh, who also does French history. We used to refer to them as the French fries. <laughs> but I also wanted to, to give a special thanks to uh, uh, Arnold Swanberg for financing this uh, uh, lecture. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I particularly appreciate graduates of institutions who try to contribute uh, back to their institution by something other than building uh, the football team or the basketball team. So uh, I certainly applaud, uh, applaud that. What I want to talk about tonight is the Battle of, uh, of Verdun. I've already gone too far. The, uh, these are the points I'm going to talk about uh, uh, tonight. Uh, but I'm really focusing on what, in many ways, is the, the worst battle of the 20th century, uh, this, uh, this great calamity uh, that's going to claim thousands of lives, uh, leave a permanent scar on France, as well as a permanent scar on, uh, on uh, uh, Germany. It's an incredible battle. It's almost unbelievable. Uh, if it had never been fought, and we wrote a book that described the battle like Verdun, the way it was actually fought, uh, people would never believe it. They would never believe that something like this could happen between civilized nations, uh, uh, civilized people. But it did happen, uh, and it left an incredible scar on uh, uh, both uh, countries. So the first question is, why did this thing uh, happen? Geography explains a lot of it. This is where Verdun is located. This is the Western Front during World War I. That line on the Western Front will move a little bit during the war, but it will not move a, uh, a lot. The Germans, in fact, planned this operation uh, uh, and really anticipate inflicting a, not a defeat on France, but to bleed France, to weaken France, to uh, treat it in the modern term, uh, in the sense of uh, causing France to lose so many people uh, in counterattacks and uh, defending that in fact France would be weakened and then the final defeat of France would be, uh, would be easier. They chose this area because they thought Verdun had special significance to the French, uh, that the French would uh, uh, fight even harder to retain it. Of course, the significance goes back to the uh, Treaty of Verdun of 832, when uh, Europe was divided into what was basically France and, uh, and Germany. Uh, so its historical significance is important, but it also took on a special significance during the war. At the beginning of this, uh, battle, before it actually started, the French had good intelligence that the Germans were going to attack, that the Germans were going to attack at Verdun. Uh, initially, the French commander, whose name was Joseph Joff, uh, decided that they would not actually uh, defend Verdun. What they would do is just simply pull back to the river uh, and not 
waste soldiers' lives defending this, uh, this area. But the uh, president of the Council of Ministers of France, uh, Aristide Briand, got word of this, and he drove up to Joffre's headquarters, which was outside Paris, not outside Verdun. In the middle of the night, uh, Joffre always went to bed early. Uh, Brion got him up out of bed, got all of his staff together, and said, you will not give up Verdun. Uh, Verdun will be defended. We will not surrender Verdun to the, uh, uh, to the Germans. And Joffre, who in fact had been planning giving up Verdun, stood up and said, uh, uh, yes, m uh, Monsieur le Minister, uh, the President of the uh, Council of Ministers, uh, of course we're going to defend Verdun. We never intended to give up Verdun uh, uh, at, at all. So both sides are pulled into this battle uh, over an area of, you know, Significance only because uh, neither would give up, only because neither would yield to the, uh, uh, to the other. Oops. This is an actual picture of the, uh, a map of the area. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but uh, this is the Meuse River. This is the line around Verdun uh, the day the Germans attacked. It's really a big, huge salient the Germans are going to attack from this, uh, uh, this area, and uh, the French are going to defend along this entire, this entire area. So the battle really occurs not for some gigantic strategic reason, uh, not for uh, an attempt to break through French lines and uh, bring a quick end to this war. Uh, the Germans were aiming to weaken the French to uh, make them less capable of continuing to, uh, continuing to fight. And the French, even though it made sense to them to give up the area, uh, when Brion says, you will defend uh, Verdun, uh, they are going to defend uh, uh, Verdun. Now, in terms of the major events of the battle, this is a long list of the major events. Let me go over each of these, but let's do it a little bite at a time. Oops. First of all, the battle begins on February the 21st. The French have plenty of notice the Germans are coming. Uh, they have a great intelligence uh, network. Uh, they have tracked units coming into the area. Uh, they have uh, fortified France more. Uh, they have brought in some additional troops, not a lot of additional uh, troops. Uh, but the, the Battle of Verdun begins with a huge artillery assault and then a ground assault by the, uh, uh, by the Germans. One of the first things they will capture is Duomont. We'll show you a little more in a second here, but there are, there's a circle of fortresses that go around Verdun, old uh, fortresses that were built in the 1871 uh, uh, to old 1900 uh, time frame uh, that are meant to protect Verdun with this circle of uh, forts. Duomont is one of the most important of those, and it is uh, captured very quickly, really almost by accident in the sense of it not being defended uh, correctly. Now, the next thing is probably one of the most important events in this battle. Pétain is sent to take command of the French forces in this area. Pétain had begun the war as a colonel. He was a colonel without any future. He faced uh, mandatory retirement. Uh, he was a, a man who expressed his viewpoint uh, re and really didn't care who heard uh, what, he, uh, what he said. Uh, but he was a man who knew his business. And in the first months of the war, the first years of the war, he demonstrated that in some fighting up on the western end of the, uh, uh, of the front, really defending uh, areas uh, quite successfully and then attacking in areas uh, with not quite so much uh, success. But he was a soldier soldier. Uh, he uh, loved his men, he tried to protect his men, he was very cautious about the expenditure of their lives, and there were plenty of generals on the French side who were not as cautious and who really did not care as much as he did about them. One of the things in his, uh, he'll write later a history of Verdun, and in there he will uh, include a description of soldiers coming back from Verdun and coming back by his headquarters and he described them in terms of how worn they were, how exhausted they were, how uh, clearly they had been through a terrible, terrible or, uh, ordeal. He noted that, he observed that, uh, he cared about that. Now, the Germans do not make 
they make some initial gains. I'll show you on the map for a second here. Uh, uh, they make some initial gains. They can't break through all the way. And eventually the Germans will move their attack to the West Bank. And I'll show you that uh, in a moment. This area is known in terms of Mortham, uh, Dead Man, and then Hill 304. Uh, uh, they're some of the most storied uh, areas in the entire Verdun uh, uh, area. But this comes in sort of the second phase of the battle when they can't break through on the, on the east bank of the Meuse, they try on the uh, west bank. Now, the problem for Pétain is that he comes up with a system called the Noria system, a brilliant system. Uh, he brings in divisions. He leaves them in the trenches for a certain period. Then he takes them out and replaces them with fresh uh, uh, troops. That enables him to have fresh troops there who are bit more capable of fighting, who aren't so exhausted they can't uh, fight. Uh, the problem with that is that his boss, General Joffre, who's uh, back in Paris, doesn't want the primary focus of the French army to be at Verdun. He wants it to be on the Somme, further to the north where the British are. He, in fact, wants a breakthrough of the lines up in the Somme area. To do that, he's got to have troops, he's got to have lots of fresh troops, and that means he doesn't want to release troops to Pétain. But slowly, gradually, Pétain is able to overcome his objections, and they rotate troops through uh, Verdun. It means most of the French army will end up rotating through Verdun at one time or the other. Joffre loses patience with Pétain, and he kicks him upstairs to the Central Army Group, and he brings in General Robert Nivelle. Nivelle had started the war as a colonel. He was a brash colonel, a cocky guy. Uh, his mother was English. He spoke perfect uh, uh, English, uh, uh, and he really polished up to uh, General Joffre. So he's put into this Verdun area. He is not as cautious with lives. He is not as caring, but Pétain has him under his thumb and really makes him do uh, whatever uh, Pétain wants him to do. Uh, a third actor in part of this, uh, and in some of the later portion, uh, is a French general by the name of Mangin, General uh, Mangin. Mangin was called uh, by his uh, soldiers, Mangin Dums, man eater, uh, and that's the way they referred to him. He was the most extreme of the French commanders in terms of uh, really wasting soldiers' uh, uh, lives. But now that Pétain is in command of the Central Army Group, there is some control over what the French do. There is some control over how they conduct their defenses and what they're going to, uh, going to do. Now, if we can see that on this map. This is a better map than the last one because the uh, terrain does not uh, confuse us. But the battle will start with this front line. This is the Meuse River. This is the city of Verdun. The Germans will make their attack from this area and they will drive the French back to this line right here. When they cannot break through that line, they will then go to the West Bank and attack over here. This is Hill 304 and this is Mortham Dead Man uh, 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 Ridge. But this area is a very small area. I don't know if you ever have had the chance to visit Verdun, but uh, it's very easy to visit because it's, it is a fairly small area. It's five kilometers but from here to here. And if you look at that, uh, what is that? About eight kilometers, the entire front uh, there. This entire distance here is maybe eight or nine kilometers in terms of how far the Germans have uh, advanced. The whole battle incurs, occurs over a relatively small uh, uh, area, and it's a relatively small area over which they fight over every single inch of ground uh, uh, there. Now this, I got that map and I want to acknowledge it from Wikipedia, and I do want to thank Wikipedia for, uh, for that information and other information. Now the next part of the Verdun Offensive just simply underlines the fact that you can't view a World War I uh, campaign simply in terms of what's happening straight ahead. Verdun is very much affected by what's going on elsewhere in this war, uh, particularly where it says June the 4th, 
Brusilov offensive begins. General Joffre, commander of the French forces and uh, sort of the quasi-head of, uh, of the Entente forces, has been trying to get not only an offensive on the Somme, but also an offensive by the Russians. And he hopes to squeeze the Germans, you know, hold at Verdun, but squeeze the Germans in between there. The Brusilov offensive is very effective, particularly against the Austrians. They drive the Austrians back a huge distance, and the Germans eventually will begin pulling troops out of Verdun and moving them to one of those other uh, uh, battlefields. But they also continue attacking at Verdun. They seize Verdun, uh, excuse me, uh, Fort Vaux. They uh, gain this almost like they did Duomont in the sense that uh, it's not one of those bitter, brutal battles, uh, but uh, the French do give up a Vaux. And then they launch, the Germans launch a new offensive on June the 23rd on the East Bank. They reach their farthest point a day or so later, and they stop. In terms of where they are, they're on the sort of a, the crest of a ring of hills that come around Verdun, and they're just at the top of those hills looking down at uh, Verdun. All they have to do is get to the bottom of the hill, and the, the French are defeated. The French have lost everything that they have. One of the problems that the French have is that they only got one way to cross the river. It's a bridge. The Germans will damage that bridge. It'll make it more difficult for the, the French to supply their troops on the, uh, on the right bank of the, of the river. Uh, it becomes a very, very difficult logistics battle for, uh, uh, for them. My finger is not as good as the clicker is here. The battle, will, the war will continue to evolve. If you've ever read a history of World War I, you've read a history of the British on the Battle of the Somme. In fact, there were French there. On the first day of the Somme, it's the French who make the major uh, drive under General uh, Fayol, uh, but that takes uh, troops from uh, uh, Verdun. It also begins to affect the Germans in the sense, here's another drain on the Germans. Here's another way of affecting what the Germans are doing there. Uh, on, on Verdun. The war is widened even farther by Romania entering the war. Initially, the Romanians just clean clock. Uh, they do whatever they want to, but then uh, they really get rid of Falkenhayn, who's the commander of, of German forces in Germany. They send him to Romania. They're kicking him out of the uh, main commands. They bring in a guy by the name of Hindenburg, who uh, you know, is become, going to become a storied commander uh, uh, at worst. Really a remarkable man in terms of what he is able to do uh, with holding the Germans uh, together. But Falkenheim will go down to Romania, and basically he will drive the Romanians practically out of the war with what he's doing. So Falkenheim may have lost his command on the Western Front, but he certainly was no dud by any, any, any means. But the French begin to counterattack. The French begin to counterattack. On October the 24th, they launch a counteroffensive. This is led by General Mongin. Uh, he's the one who does most of the work uh, for this. Nouvelle gets the credit, but it's Mongin who puts it uh, to, uh, uh, together. Uh, they do regain Fort Duomont. Uh, then they're going to regain Vaux. And they're going to prepare for another counteroffensive. When you think of a counteroffensive, you think of bringing in troops, you think of bringing in equipment. What they had to do here, uh, they had to build roads across that devastated ground. They actually built a few of the uh, uh, small railway lines to carry equipment, to carry everything uh, else. It's a logistical nightmare uh, at, uh, at best. But uh, they eventually will launch another counteroffensive on December the 15th, and then they will, that means they have regained most of the East Bank. Now you can see that in this map in the sense they're going to drive from here up to here. And you know, the first move is about to here. 
Then they build roads, then they build railway lines, then they bring up logistics, they get everything together, and then they launch out uh, uh, again. Now, in terms of how the battle actually, actually ended, though, it, this is a huge, and huge is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't even express how large it is in terms of artillery. The offensive that the French launched on October the 24th, they used 696 pieces of artillery. They have fired 830,000 artillery rounds. Uh, they will use, have two 400 meter, uh, uh, 400 millimeter, <laughs> that'd be a big cannon, 400 meter, two 400 millimeter uh, uh, cannon. This is the large railway uh, guns. You've seen uh, photos of them. Basically all it is is a gigantic mortar that shoots around up way high and then it comes back down. They know the ballistics, so they're able to march these rounds directly onto Vaux, directly onto Duomont, and it's really those guns that weaken those forts that enable the French to recapture them. But they also have, you know, the 370 meter, meter, millimeter, 280 millimeter, and 270 millimeter guns. This battle marks a transition for the French because up to this point, the Germans had the advantage in artillery. The French had started the war with only light <clears throat> mobile artillery, and they fight the first two years of this war uh, at a severe disadvantage to the, uh, uh, to the Germans. But by the time they get to the end of the Battle of Verdun and they f uh, launch these counteroffensives, they are about equal to the Germans in terms of the capability of their guns. Uh, they don't just have 75 anymore, they have 105s, they have 155s, and then they have all of these other uh, huge caliber uh, uh, weapons. <clears throat> what they add new on December 15th, in addition to all of that artillery, they actually use aerial bombardment. And this is part of the firing plan, this is part of the uh, uh, preparation. Uh, uh, this, when you think of battles and you think of the use of firepower, I mean, Verdun is almost in a category of its, uh, of its own. This is just an example from a newspaper. I took this off the, uh, the web, of uh, the sort of headline that the French were reading and what they were getting about uh, this information. This is from Humanité, which is a left-wing uh, uh, journal. They'll, they describe something about attack on a front of seven kilometers. Uh, German line is, uh, is broken everywhere. Uh, the French people know something about this, uh, this battle in terms of what the newspapers say, but most of the information that they get comes from the soldiers themselves. Initially, the soldiers don't get any leaves, any passes, but one of the things that Pétain insists on is passes and leaves for his, uh, his soldiers. So these guys will go from a trench at Verdun to their home, wherever their home is, uh, so the people in France have a pretty good idea that this is a horrible, horrible, horrible battle that's being fought up, uh, up there. But finally, at the end of it, when they launched that offensive on the, on the 15th of December, the French newspapers see this as a great victory. These are the headlines from three newspapers. Uh, the Victory of Verdun, that's from Le Figaro, which is sort of center. Uh, uh, vic victory to the north of Duomont, that's from Echo de uh, Paris, that's a, a right-wing uh, journal, newspaper. And then Humanité, which is left, which says our, attacks are attacking, our troops are attacking north of Duomont and they have broken the front uh, on three, or have driven it back three uh, uh, kilometers. So, so whatever this victory or this battle may appear to us today in terms of being incredibly bloody, incredibly pointless, incredibly costly. On 16 December, the French said, victory at Verdun, victory at Verdun. Now, there are a lot of things that gave them that victory, and these are the techniques that they use. The Noria system I mentioned, the rolling broad system. Uh, when we Americans enter the war in 1917, we really don't have this rolling broads down uh, at all. The French have this down at Verdun. When they move troops, they move with the rolling barrage. Uh, they really have this down. The person who put this together is General Nivelle. Uh, that's how he made general. That's how he gained his, uh, his reputation. 
I showed you the artillery support. But the other thing they do once they get this victory at Verdun is they study this battle. They study this battle. They put all sorts of lessons learned pamphlets together. Uh, those of us who've worn a uniform for a long time know what lessons learned are. Well, the French brought that to an extreme here. They had everything from the right way to wear your poncho to, uh, you know, how to do a rolling barrage. Everything was put in, uh, in writing because they thought they had figured it out because they had driven the Germans back from Verdun in that first attack and they had driven the Germans back in that second attack. From their perspective at the time, this was a great victory and this was just the beginning of the end for Germany. General Robert Nivelle goes from being that army commander to the replacement for Joff. He's the victorious general at Verdun, and he, of course, is going to launch them the following April on the disastrous Nivelle Offensive, where the French army fails, the French army almost collapses, uh, and the French army almost loses the war as the Americans show up to uh, reinforce them in this uh, in this war. I showed you the, that information. But the question is, what were the casualties? What were the casualties uh, in this uh, battle? Read it today, you think it was a huge, huge number. If you look at it from the French perspective, it's a little different. This is the number of killed according to their official history. 61,000, 214,000 wounded, 100,000 disappeared, disparu, as they would say. What is disparu? It could be captured. It could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, going AWOL or surrendering to the Germans, or it could be, you know, sitting in a foxhole when a 400-millimeter uh, round uh, occupies that, uh, that hole with you. There are 100,000 people at the end of this battle that they don't know where, uh, uh, where they are. Uh, if you look at the total casualties at the battle for the French, it's about 375,000. The casualties for the Germans are also about 375,000. The difference is the French suffer more killed than the Germans, uh, and uh, the, uh, therefore, uh, by the total number of casualties, it may add up to the same, but in fact, in terms of killed, the Germans suffer more killed than do the, uh, excuse me, the French suffer more killed than do the, uh, the Germans. Now this is a graph you probably have never seen before. This is a graph showing French casualties by month during World War I. This is 1914, this is 1915, this is 1916, this is 1917, and this is 1918. Notice the casualties they took in the first two months of the war. 165,000 either killed or captured during each month of the war. That's 300, uh, over 300,000. Then the number drops down. In 1915, this is the massive offensive they launch up or in Artois near the uh, Somme area. This is the massive offensive they launched that year in Champagne, which is west of Verdun. And then these are the casualties from Verdun. In fact, you look at this peak here. This peak is when the British launched their offensive on the Somme. The French also launched their offensive on the Somme at that time. So all the casualties for France in 1916 that it shows here are not just from Verdun. They also are from the Somme. If you look a little further, though, this is April 1917. This is General Nivelle's offensive. This is the victor of Verdun, using all that he learned in the Verdun school to launch one of the worst attacks that's ever been put uh, into action anywhere. Note that this is the month the United States declares war, enters the war, the French army is as close to defeat at this point as they are in this entire war. Continuing on, Pétain comes back. He holds back the casualties. These are two offenses that he launches. And then the Americans come in. The Americans really come into action at about this, uh, about this point. The French casualties in World War I, notice 
1914, they take 29.4% of all the casualties they're going to have in this entire war, 23% the next year, and then 19% in 1916, with about 30% th about of those casualties in 1916 coming from the Somme, not coming from uh, uh, Verdun. Going back to the, uh, uh, to the map, or this, uh, this chart, uh, this area uh, is really the German offensive in 1918, uh, where the Germans, uh, the German Spring Offensive, this is when the Americans come into, uh, uh, into the uh, uh, battle. So the Americans really learn about this battle how? That's the key question. Whoops. First of all, by military attaches. They have military attaches in Paris, in London, in Berlin. They, uh, uh, these attaches are permitted to visit battlefields. Uh, the, uh, particularly the French and British will turn them loose. The Germans do not turn them loose. The Germans escort them. They limit them severely in terms of what they can uh, see, what they can learn about what's going on. Uh, and uh, uh, the Germans are aware that uh, the bulk of the logistical support for the French and the British, not the bulk, but a huge amount of it, uh, is coming from the United States. They don't see the United States as being completely neutral. And the last thing they want is somebody who's not neutral, not neutral seeing what they're doing on the battlefield. So they get information from military attaches. They get information from newspapers. My last year at West Point, uh, we got a new computer system in the library uh, that had you know, all sorts of subscriptions for newspapers. And I went over there one day, and lo and behold, I discovered you could do a word search on newspapers. So I decided to do a word search with the word Verdun on some of the major American newspapers, New York Times, uh, uh, Chicago uh, Tribune, San Francisco, I can't remember the San Francisco uh, paper. And I was really amazed at the amount of information that was available in the newspaper about uh, Verdun. Had all sorts of inflated figures of casualties, all sorts of inflated uh, deeds that were done, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, of, uh, of reports from, uh, from soldiers. But my point is, there was a huge amount of information available. Unless your name is John J. Per whoops, John J. Pershing, and you are in the Mexican expedition. You go on the Mexico punitive uh, expedition, March 1916 to February 1917. Pershing later says he followed the Battle of Verdun very carefully. I don't know how he did it. Uh, they didn't have computers that day. You certainly couldn't go on the web and get information from the newspapers. Uh, uh, I doubt he followed it as carefully as he said that he did. The Germans will declare unrestricted submarine warfare uh, in February 1917, and then we're in the war in April 1917. My point is, we could have learned a lot about World War I, about the fighting at Verdun, but we did not. One of the reasons that we did not was that Woodrow Wilson uh, learned that the general staff, the Army general staff, in the equivalent of the Pentagon at that time, was studying this, this uh, war and looking at alternatives. And he immediately decreed that uh, those people would not do that, that half of them had to leave Washington immediately. So they went from 51 officers on the general staff down to about 25 or 26. They would get all of these reports in from the military attaches about this battle, and they've got this information about uh, aeronautics, this information about artillery, and basically it sits unopened on a desk uh, in uh, the general staff uh, headquarters. It just simply was information that was available, that could have been used, that could have been valuable, but in fact was not used uh, at all. One of the great mistakes, uh, uh, the greatest mistakes the United States has ever made. Of course, we enter the war uh, uh, later uh, in 1917. Uh, that is the day we enter or declare war is right about the same time Nivelle launches his offensive. Uh, it's about the same time that the French army mutinies. Had we not come in about the time that we did in terms of marching down the Champs-Élysées on the 4th of July, 
uh, it's very possible that the outcome of this war would have been, uh, uh, would have been different. The French, whatever they did at Verdun, uh, they drew a good hand in that, uh, uh, in that sense. But look at this casualties. This is, this is uh, the three major battles that the Americans will fight uh, and about the lo loss of the uh, number of casualties of the uh, Meuse-Argonne Offensive. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive, of course, is later in the year. But I put those in just to show that it, it was American presence uh, that was very, very important in terms of the outcome of this, uh, uh, of this war. But to go back to Verdun, this is the battle that Joff did not want to fight, that the Germans did want to fight. The Germans wanted to bleed the French white. Uh, in fact, what happens is the French are bled white, the Germans are bled white. They found that once they got into this tar baby of a battle, that they just couldn't turn loose of it. And it led to incredible casualties. As I showed you, about 375,000 on each uh, side, uh, with the total killed uh, on each side, you know, or at least on the French side, being uh, well over 150,000. Uh, uh, so about 300,000 killed in the battle, uh, maybe somewhat, uh, somewhat less. Uh, the key battles, of course, again, are seen on this, uh, but it really was, in retrospect, an incredible uh, battle. Today at Verdun, if you go visit Verdun, you will see monuments everywhere. They have a huge uh, uh, mausoleum there uh, where they have the bones of over 100,000 soldiers uh, there. They have a huge uh, cemetery. Uh, there are monuments uh, everywhere, but much of the ground is still torn up the way it was then. The difference is trees have grown up and you can't really walk over the entire area. There are tons of unexploded ordnance they have uh, destroyed lots of that unexploded ordnance, but it's still uh, you know, under the ground, on top of the ground. Some of the soil continues to be polluted from some of the gas that was employed in this, uh, uh, in this battle. So this, this was uh, an incredible battle. Let me go back to, to this one. Incredible battle uh, left a lasting impression on the soldiers who uh, I went through here, whether they were German or whether they were, uh, they were French, lay, uh, left a lasting mark on the terrain itself and really a lasting mark on the history of, uh, of warfare. A terrible, terrible, uh, terrible battle uh, that didn't accomplish much. The great irony of this battle is that at the end of it, the French thought they had won it. And I challenge you to pick up any book anywhere uh, that takes a longer view that says the French won this, uh, this battle. But in the eyes of General Robert Nivelle and the eyes of the French generals at this time, the French had won this, uh, this battle. Let's hope we never win any battles like that. Any questions? <laughs> Questions and there's microphones set up on either side. Does anyone have a question? Uh, evening, sir. Uh, I, uh, I have a. Uh, what made it fairly late? Question. What made it so terrible? Uh, was it the, the and, and why did it last so long? Was it the tactics, the strategies, the lack of strategy? I mean, what was it, the terrain? You know what I mean? Well, it lasted so long because the French did not give up and just pull back to the other side of the river. Had they pulled back to the other side of the river, it would have uh, uh, lasted a much shorter time. The casualties would have been uh, less. The cost would have been less for them and for the Germans. Uh, but the French, once, once they were in this battle and once they had expended so many lives, they couldn't just say, well, the end, this quarter is over, let's pull back and play another quarter. Uh, uh, back there on, on the river. It was just something that they, uh, their psyche would not let them do. Remember, the Germans also could have stopped. Uh, they, they make their fathers to dance by June the 24th, uh, and they get just to the, that ring of hills overlooking Verdun, and all they had to do was go over the top of that hill 
and then go to the bottom of the hill, they would have cut off the French forces on the east side of the river. They could have dropped that bridge and all those French forces would have been uh, cut off uh, over there, uh, but they were unable to do that. They fired uh, uh, massive amounts of artillery uh, on that bridge trying to drop it and just did not succeed uh, uh, doing it. So one of those battles that once it started, uh, they just couldn't figure out how to end it. It's terrible. Thank you for your speech. Um, I was wondering, you spoke about that headline and it was in a different language. What, uh, what date was it? Did what? it have a date on it? The, the uh, headlines? Yeah, the headlines. Yeah, they were December the 16th. And I took those off the web. I just went to those newspapers and copied them off on those, the uh, those days. They were convinced they had won this battle. They had driven the Germans back. That first thing, then they, that first, to that, uh, in that first drive, they stopped, brought up all their equipment, brought up all their ammunition, and then they drove them back farther. They were convinced they had found the way to win this war. General Duvel announces, uh, I have the formula. I have the formula. And his formula was more of the same in terms of what he had done in October and then in December to defeat the Germans. They were convinced that they could do that on a larger level and they could defeat the Germans. Uh, what they forgot was that, you know, in war there's always an opponent who can adjust uh, uh, his method, where he is, what he, how he fights, and that's what the Germans did when they attack when the French attack in April, they, it's just a replay of what they tried to do uh, at Verdun. Only problem is they basically broadcast what they were doing. Uh, it was in the newspapers. Uh, they talked about it at cocktail parties. Uh, you know, the Germans would have had to have been dumb and blind not to have known that this attack was uh, coming. And the attack just turned out to be an unmitigated disaster, one of the great disasters of the 20th century, definitely. Thank you. I just have a couple of comments. I spent a whole day between uh, Verdun and Fort Dumont, I call it. Yeah. And my, my goal was to find a trench to jump in, to <laughs> kind of get to feel the trench warfare. And the best I could do was the, the trench of the bayonets, which yeah. are the, but they have a fantastic museum at Ver, Verdun. Yes. Fantastic. And I'm walking in there and they have a case with uniforms. And here was an American Red Cross uniform on a mannequin down below, donated by Mrs. Greeno, Missoula, Montana. <laughs> Mr. Greeno's daughter, I guess, was a um, Red Cross there yeah. at, the, at yeah. the battle. Her. But there are American, uh, uh, American volunteers uh, who drive those ambulances before the United States enters the uh, uh, the war. I have an uncle from uh, Catahoula Parish, where Catahoula Curs are uh, are famous, which is far back in the woods of uh, of Louisiana, who volunteered to be an ambulance driver. First of all, I don't know how he found out there was a war going on because I don't think there was a newspaper. Uh, but he ended up going to uh, France and driving an ambulance in uh, uh, at Verdun. The French are deeply appreciative of that ambulance uh, corps. If you go into that that museum where they have that, that display, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it is uh, one of the, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best displays in that museum at, uh, uh, at uh, Verdun. Uh, it's, you know, in one of the uh, fortresses, so it's, uh, you know, it's real life in that sense. Uh, but those, those Americans were volunteers who uh, were on their, over there on their own initiative. Uh, many of them, uh, in fact, came from the Northeast, maybe the Ivy League schools, but there were, in fact, uh, people from Louisiana. You know, my uncle was there. I have no idea how he got there or, or why. Uh, he died before I could ever ask him that, uh, uh, that question. But uh, the, the ambulance drivers were always uh, appreciated, definitely. Yes, sir. What was the German perception of the outcome of the battle? Excuse me? The German perception of the outcome of the battle, did they think they, they had won as well? No, no. When Hindenburg comes in, uh, he and Ludendorff go to visit Verdun. And all they have to do is visit and realize that this is a disaster, uh, that they're taking terrible casualties there. And what they will do is pull troops out of Verdun and leave only uh, 
a token force is the wrong word, but one of the reasons that the French succeed with those two offensives in October and December is the Germans have pulled troops out. Uh, so there are not as many Germans there. The number, the amount of German artillery is less. Uh, it's an entirely different battle area than it was, uh, you know, six months previously before uh, the Germans, before Hindenburg uh, came in, uh, got in charge. But Hindenburg uh, uh, recognized immediately, this is a quagmire, this is not going to win us the war, we need to do something other than, uh, uh, than this. His mistake, in my opinion, I was talking to someone about this today, is when the Germans go east in 1917, Nivelle Offensive is launched in 1917, the French army mutinies, their mutiny was much more like a strike in the sense that they said, we're not leaving these trenches. Uh, they shoot about six officers. Uh, uh, they will ultimately execute about 50 uh, soldiers for uh, uh, disobedience, uh, uh, mutiny, uh, that sort of stuff. But the French army is at its weakest at that particular point. Had the Germans turned west instead of east, uh, then they likely would have had an even larger effect uh, from those troops than what they had uh, on, the eastern, uh, on the Eastern Front. It's sort of a what if question, uh, to say the least. Yes, sir. Um, I guess you kind of partly answered my question, but I was wondering, you mentioned the mutiny uh, in the French army. Did, um, did it affect the, the French army at Verdun? Did the, uh, what, the, the mutiny? Yes, I mean. Uh, yes, yes, but it didn't, uh, uh, it's not as severe as it was in the area where the Nivelle Offensive was launched, launched. They didn't launch the Nivelle Offensive there at Verdun. Basically, they left a, uh, a light force there to hold the trenches, to hold on what they had gained. The offensive is farther to the west in the, what the French would call the Champagne area. Uh, and the, most of the mutinies, the worst mutinies, occurred right in the middle of that attack. They knew that was a, the soldiers knew that their lives were being wasted uh, and their revolt was as much against their lives being wasted as it was against anything, uh, uh, anything else. There were no fans of uh, General Robert Nivelle in those uh, trenches, to say the least. Yes, sir. Sir, so could you comment on the place Verdun has in the French culture and particularly well, first of all, it's iconic of the First World War, but also perhaps on the performance of the French army uh, and their rapid collapse in the Second World War. If you read Alistair Horne, uh, what is his book called? Oh, excuse me? I can't hear tonight, I'm sorry. I can t say it again, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. No, not the road to Verdun. It's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's on the 1940 campaign. And he connects the defeat in 1940 right straight back to Verdun. Uh, he thinks it erodes their will to fight. Uh, he thinks it erodes all sorts of things in the culture and the body politic of the uh, French. He just draws a straight line from Verdun to the collapse in 19, uh, uh, 1940. I would not uh, do that. I don't agree with that at all. I think the, the defeat in 1940 uh, comes from a lot of factors, uh, but it's not just what happened at Verdun. Uh, I have spent weeks in the area of uh, Sedan, France, uh, where uh, the German 19th Panzer Corps made the penetration and then drove in behind the, uh, uh, the French, really began the race to the sea and all of that. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for why the Germans were able to cross the Meuse there, why the Germans were able to advance why the French did not uh, uh, defend as, uh, as uh, actively, as strongly as they could have. But, you know, you can't really connect that to World War I. You can connect some of the methods to that, uh, but you can't say this straight line comes from Verdun to uh, 1940. I disagree with him. Uh, 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 to lose a battle. No, not to, what is in the world? Is that it? To lose a battle, to lose a battle. okay. Yes, sir. There was an assassination uh, that is said to have been part of the reason for the start of World War I. It was it Archduke Ferdinand and his wife? Yes. Were, and and uh, there were many countries involved. Uh, watching one of the TV specials on World War I, I was surprised to see that the Turks were involved. But could you uh, lay out 
the, the names of the players, uh, and if there is a real reason for the start of that war, uh, talk about that a little bit, and then also uh, the tunnels, the miners that were brought in, uh, and the underground war. It, uh, in terms of the, the base, who's on uh, what side, uh, you, you really have uh, the French, uh, the, uh, uh, the British, uh, the Americans, and then a host of other countries on the Entente side, uh, and the Italians, you can't leave out the Italians. And on the central powers, you have basically Austria-Hungary, you have Germany, you have part of the Ottoman uh, Empire. The war will expand from that shot at Sarajevo uh, into a worldwide war. Uh, there are uh, na uh, several naval battles for arts outside uh, Europe. There's some fighting in uh, Cameroon in Africa. Uh, for example, uh, it, it is a world war, but it's not a world war in the World War II sense. Uh, it's a world war in the sense of most of the fighting will occur within the boundaries of, uh, of Europe. Some of it will happen in the Middle East, the modern Middle East, uh, with all its problems. A lot of that comes out of World War I. Uh, the peace treaties, if that's the right word, uh, that finished the war drew many of those uh, boundaries, and those boundaries did not take into account many of the, uh, many of the religious differences, the historical differences in that, uh, uh, in that area. So it's, uh, it's a war in which, uh, you know, uh, many millions of people were involved, uh, but many, most of the major battles occurred right there on the Western Front, right there between uh, uh, the French and the Germans. If you go on the Eastern Front, uh, you end up with some massive, massive uh, uh, battles. Had the Russians won the uh, Battle of Tannenberg, you know, the whole war would have been different in the sense of the way it uh, could have come out. So uh, uh, important battles all over the world. To my, for me, my great interest is France, the Western Front, and that's why I know so much about it. In terms of my comment on the generals, uh, the people who've been most savage in the treatment of the generals are, Briti are ri usually British authors. If you've read the book called The Donkeys, uh, he really is a scathing, scathing criticism of the uh, British generals. There are books similar to that in French with scathing criticism of the French, uh, uh, French generals. Uh, of all the French generals who are criticized, uh, you know, maybe the longest list of complaints is with General Robert Nivelle, uh, with that Nivelle offensive and some of the ludicrous stuff they tried uh, uh, to do. Uh, generalship was not at its peak during World War I. Uh, it took thousands of lives for generals to learn how to launch the attacks that they led. Uh, it was not something that was uh, intuitive. It was not something that their staff could always explain clearly uh, to them. It was a terrible learning process that cost thousands of lives as they uh, figured it out. The rolling barrage is an example of that. In fact, when they get the rolling barrage down, it's, very, it's something that they can do uh, automatically. But learning how to do that uh, costs uh, thousands of soldiers their, uh, uh, their lives. I'm not sure what else I could say on generals. Is that enough? Miners and the tunnels. Oh, the miners in the tunnels, yes. I'm sorry. We talked about that before uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, one of the, some of the most interesting things you can see uh, on the Western Front are the tunnels. Uh, if you go up into the area of Vimy Ridge in the British uh, sector uh, in uh, Belgium and that part of the area, back in the Dark Ages, many of those villages were linked with tunnels. And when they started all the fighting in that area, they discovered, rediscovered some of these tunnels and used a lot of those tunnels for moving supplies, bringing in troops. If you go to Vimy Ridge, uh, uh, they have a huge tunnel that goes up to the top of the ridge and a huge tunnel that comes down. If you actually go to Vimy Ridge and go into that tunnel and you can take a tour of that tunnel, as you go along, there are tunnels that go off to the side and those are the old tunnels uh, that were there really when those, uh, those tunnels were uh, were dug. In other portions of the front, uh, they will dig, uh, they will dig uh, tunnels, they will use tunnels. One of the things that they do with tunnels is the mining, in the sense they try to mine under the enemy, 
Then they try to fill the tunnel with explosives and then light it up and blow the people off the, uh, uh, off the top. And there are a number of those big, huge, massive holes in the ground up in the British sector of the Western uh, Front. At least that's the part that's best known in terms of the uh, mining. But mining was very, very important. Uh, the uh, gas mass that they finally use or, or begin to develop, some of the technology that they, that they get in terms of figuring that out really comes from miners' uh, miners' helmets, helmets, excuse me. So it, it was, uh, you know, miners are all over the Western Front, to, uh, to say the least. Yes, sir. I had an instructor, uh, guest instructor from the National Defense University, express to the opinions at a seminar some years ago that uh, General John J. Pershing enters combat on the Western Front armed with the theory that all of his predecessors, including those that were done, had been wrong and very little else. Would you agree? That Pershing was right? Um, or that, that Pershing entered the Western Front uh, pretty much convinced that all of his predecessors uh, with Western Front experience had been doing things he, wrong. He, he arrived convinced that the uh, French did not know what they were doing. He arrived uh, thinking uh, uh, these people have purposely dug these entrenchments. Uh, these people should have gotten out of these entrenchments. Uh, they should have uh, you know, fixed bayonets and uh, uh, driven those other guys out of the uh, uh, entrenchments. He favored something called open warfare. Uh, I really think is one of the worst ideas any American general has ever had in all the wars that we have, uh, we have fought. I just read a book by a man by the name of Gene, uh, I think his last name is Fax, and it's about the 79th Division in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. And one of the things that he talked about that I did not realize had happened in that offensive is in some cases the American troops attacked without artillery support. So you can imagine charging these entrenchments with those machine guns and rifles and the horrible, the horrible casualties that they, uh, uh, that they took. But uh, Pershing was convinced that was the way to do it, uh, and he insisted that his people do it that, uh, that way. It cost Americans thousands of lives. But when you weigh those lives in comparison to what the, the French lost in August 1914 and September 1914, we Americans will lose about 30,000 lives in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Uh, the French will lose, what was my figure, 165,000 the first month, 165,000 the second month, and their population is about two-thirds of, uh, uh, of our population. So uh, there are a lot of bad tactical ideas circulating through every side in this army, to include in the German army, uh, a lot of people are not aware of that, the massacre of the innocents, in 1914, where they take thousands of casualties attacking machine guns basically without artillery uh, preparation. This is not, you know, if you look at the military profession, this is not a high point of the military profession. The, the technology may be, but the soldiers, the leaders' understanding of it was not at all, no doubt. Yes, ma'am. So why, in your view, did uh, President Wilson fire the general staff when they tried to study Verdun? Was he trying to prove that he wasn't going to intervene in the war? Or? Yeah, exactly. He was, he was afraid that, uh, 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 that somehow or another this would draw the United States uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the war. So he, in fact, decreed that these people don't work here anymore. Uh, I kept a bare, you know, half of them were in there to do some of the basic uh, work that they had to do, but the rest had to, uh, uh, had to leave. Uh, uh, it was really one of the worst decisions that any president has ever made, as far as I'm concerned. Even if you had just let them do nothing but study the war, uh, the United States would have been better prepared. Now, what we don't know, to go back to the other question, is whether even if those people had understood what was going on, whether they could have convinced John J. Pershing that there was a better way of doing it, better than charging those machine guns with your bare chest with a little bit of artillery uh, uh, support. That's one question we will never, uh, ever answer. The French answered it in 1914 and took, you know, 310,000 killed uh, uh, in two months in the war. Incredible, incredible losses. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you believe that the French success with the heavily fortified area around Verdun led them to an over-reliance on forts in the interwar period and 
going into World War II? Did, did, I, I, I can't hear tonight. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Do you believe that the French success with forts in the Verdun area led them to have an over-reliance on fortifications going in? To it the contributed to it. It contributed to it. When they do the, uh, I have read uh, much of the material uh, in the French archives of the service historic on that specific uh, subject. Uh, uh, that decision about the design of the Maginot Line, uh, much of the uh, uh, policy about that comes out of the meetings of something called the Superior Council of War. Uh, they will talk about a number of things there to include the experience of World War I. Some of the generals will, uh, will recognize that uh, or will argue that it's an area of defense that was important, not deep underground fortifications uh, as they were talking about with the, uh, uh, with the Maginot Line. They look at it very, very carefully. They argue about it. Uh, Joff comes in for the uh, uh, discussions uh, and they end up designing the Maginot Line. Uh, uh, you know, as one of my uh, students uh, once said, it worked. The problem was it was in the wrong place. So, uh, uh, but it was a terrible, terrible idea that they tried to draw from their experience and uh, did not succeed with that uh, uh, at all. Yes, sir. As you know, later on, uh, Le Marshal Pétain was head of uh, French government, which was collaborating with Nazi Germany in the 40s. Yeah. Now, one of the arguments for him to become uh, head of the government was that he was the hero of Verdun. And so I was going to ask you, uh, are you aware of how and why this mythic, heroic representation of Pétain has developed uh, between uh, the end of the First World War and the 40s? Uh, I, I, I know a, a bit about it, but I certainly don't know all the detail uh, about it. But it was uh, the, 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 the mythic image of that came from so much of the French army having rotated through there and so much of the French army having seen the sacrifice of their friends, their buddies, uh, and known the sacrifice uh, of that. Uh, to them, it became hallowed ground with regard to the price that was paid uh, uh, there. Uh, the, uh, uh, the unfortunate aspect of that was that, uh, as I said in the previous question, uh, they will draw too much from that in the sense of being able to defend, being able to do it uh, uh, in a certain way. And then when they tried, uh, tried to do some of that uh, with the Germans or against the Germans, it simply did not uh, work. But it wasn't the myth of Verdun that, uh, uh, that shaped that so much as, uh, as the French looked at the new technology that was coming in in terms of uh, uh, aircraft, in terms of tanks, in terms of communications, in terms of uh, uh, you know, in, encryption, different sort of encryption in terms of codes and all of, uh, all of uh, that. They were looking at that technology and sort of transposing it into their view of what the future would look like. It turned out that view was absolutely wrong. Uh, and it turned out the army that they designed for 1940, uh, they didn't think it was 1940, but the army that they designed just simply wouldn't function uh, on the 1940 uh, uh, battlefield. The tanks failed, uh, the, uh, the aviation failed, the communications failed. I mean, it was truly a systemic failure in terms of all the things uh, that just simply didn't work as well as they had uh, uh, expected. If you go to Sudan, as I have, I think I said uh, earlier that I've spent many, many days there and have enjoyed every day I've ever been there. Uh, the, uh, and you, you walk the ground uh, uh, one of the things you realize is that when the Germans got to Sudan, the troops that were fighting there had fought in Poland, uh, had trained extensively after they came out of Poland, uh, had trained for a mobile type of warfare, and the French soldiers who are in those bunkers there at Sedan, overlooking the place where the 19th Panzer Corps crossed the, uh, crossed the Meuse rivers, they'd never been shot at. Uh, they had been in those bunkers uh, since May the 10th when the uh, Germans had crossed over from the German to the Luxembourg uh, uh, border. Many of them had not had any fresh water 
any food, had not seen their company commander, hadn't seen any people for days. Uh, you know, the fact that they lasted as long as they lasted is, uh, uh, is remarkable. But that failure did not come from the myth of Verdun. It came from failures of leadership, uh, failures of uh, conception, uh, and also failures of, uh, of, of execution. But it's uh, really, to me, it's a fascinating uh, question. Yes, sir. Mr. General, would you comment on the use of gas, specifically in Verdun, and then generally in World War I, offensively and uh, defensively? I, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, what I know about it is that it was, uh, uh, it was widely used. Uh, it had uh, uh, an incredible uh, effect. My, uh, I've, I've got some friends who have done some work in the chemical warfare during that, uh, uh, that era, and they could answer your question far better than, uh, than I. Uh, the point I would make is that initially they really had no defense against it. They figured out some sort of, the, uh, of defense uh, that worked reasonably uh, well to save some lives, but gas remains a threat for the entire war. By the end of the war, uh, they are more accustomed to dealing with it uh, you have trouble with American soldiers forcing them to wear their gas masks. Uh, uh, they were just something extra as far as they were concerned uh, that they had to carry until they were exposed to gas, at which time they, uh, they appreciated it. But, uh, you know, I, don't, I can't give you a lot of detail on the chemical warfare aspects uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the war. Yes, sir. You said that uh, in, in the beginning there that uh, aircraft weren't really used. But that towards the end of the war, they or towards uh, excuse me in the battle, that towards the end uh, they were. Uh, my question is that was close air support kind of not had not come of age at the beginning, and that the the kind of the strategy and the tactics had been evolved, or was it was it just the capability by uh, the offensive in December was about the same as capability uh, in uh, uh, October. If if you look at the history of war in terms of the. Uh, the creation of the air arm and the importance of the air arm. The first aircraft are really put up in the air to uh, find out where the enemy is, and it's only slowly that it evolved into something beyond that. By the time the Verdun battle begins, the skies are filled with aircraft, and it's an incredibly important dimension uh, uh, in, in uh, every conceivable way. But the reason I put it on the December thing is that they integrated that into their attack. The, you know, the attack on the ground will occur at this time uh, with this many aircraft, uh, and it's, it's part of the overall maneuver, uh, maneuver plan. But the aircraft have been very important all, uh, all along. When the, Ger when the Germans do the Schlieffen plan, come through Belgium and sweep toward Paris, and then they make the loop to the east of Paris as opposed to the west, the way the Allies see that is an aircraft flies over and sees them turn, they report it, then they send out additional aircraft to, uh, uh, to see uh, if, in fact, the Germans have gone east of Paris and not west of Paris. Uh, once they confirm that, uh, they, put, they really put their uh, operational plan together, their strategic maneuver, and ultimately the French are able to win that, uh, that campaign. It's much because, you know, that one aircraft was up there and one aircraft saw them and reported it, and then they were able to react uh, uh, to it. Okay. Any other any other questions?